roads all the way to Thomasville. And maiden names written on the land echo through the red clay hills. Where the scent of long leaf float and pine reach up on past that Georgia line. Stroll through Tallahassee town or southern Appalachia bound. Take the local roads and journey down the roads we call our Coming up on WFSU Public Media's Local Roots. The Wild West from the 1800s gets a competitive upgrade in today's world of cowboy action shooting. Plus, we explore the surprises of a North Florida spring. That's aquatic milkweed. It has an egg on it. It has an egg. From caterpillars and their eggs in the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge to the striped newts of the Apalachicola National Forest. Local Roots is next on WFSU. Take the local routes and journey down the roads we call our home. Welcome to Local Routes. I'm Suzanne Smith with WFSU Public Media. And today I'm on FAMU Way right next to Railroad Square. The area I'm in right now is called the Market Space. And in one month on Saturday, April 27th, this will be the location for the kickoff of WFSU's Eco Citizen Day. I'll share more with you on that in a few minutes, but first I want to talk about a completely different activity. It's called Cowboy Action Shooting. It's a hobby that combines the love of cowboy history, fast action shooting, and competition. WFSU's Mike Plummer spent the day with a group who aimed to show him and us what it's all about. On the third Saturday of each month, a group of rootin', tootin', shootin' cowboys get together at the Tallahassee Rifle and Pistol Club in southern Leon County. They're here to throw some lead and have a hoot or two. This is SAS, Cowboy Action Shooting. SASS is an acronym which stands for the Single Action Shooting Society. It is a worldwide society that has over 105,000 members. All the firearms that we use are single action firearms. The revolvers, you have to draw the hammer back and then fire it. Each action is single. The rifles are lever action, you have to rack those. And the uh, uh, shotguns are either a pump shotgun or a double barrel shotgun. So everything's single action. And you will shoot 10 rounds out of your revolvers, five out of each, 10 rounds out of your rifle, and anywhere from four to six out of your shotgun, depending on the number of shot down targets there are. It's a timed event. 63.82, spotted say, clean with a P. And of course you want to go as fast as you can, but you want to hit all the targets. The time penalties for missing a target exceed the amount of time it takes to slow down and aim at that target. Cowboy action shooting is a uh, first and foremost a competitive shooting sport, but uh, it's also about costuming, which you can see a little bit about here. Um, we combine the two. We get out here to have fun with dressing up like old style 1800 cowboys or the old B westerns or the old TV westerns, you know, just to have fun. Um, the competition itself is. Uh, Sometimes fierce, but always fun. I'm here to make a withdrawal. Shooter the cake's ready. Stand by. Today, well, today was a character building experience. <laughs> the, uh, the brain went a little faster than the body could go. <laughs> That's a character builder. We shoot period firearms that are pre-1900, 
The firearms are uh, either replicas or originals. Some of us have original firearms made in the uh, era. Uh, others are made by different manufacturers now from all over the world. The targets are made of steel plate. A competition or day of shooting is made up of stages, and each stage has a particular target order that applies. Of course, you want to go as fast as you can, but without missing. And I, I tell people, sp speed comes with accuracy. Be accurate first, and if you do it and you hit them every time, you're going to get better and better and better, and before you know it, you're hitting them every time and you're fast. In the period, the uh, people carried the same caliber firearms because otherwise you were carrying all sorts of different ammunition and you were wondering what you were loading at the time. Much like we do, you know, don't put the wrong one in the wrong gun because that's going to cause you difficulties. Um, also, uh, some of that sprang from the um, military use. They wanted to only distribute one kind of ammunition. so. The, you would call it pistol caliber, which is what we're talking about, um, was the most common for everyone to carry and use. The 45s that I use, the 44s that people use, the 38s, all of those are made for both pistol and rifle. Now our posse shoots at the Tallahassee Rifle Pistol Club and most of them are members, but to shooting cowboy action you don't have to be a member of the club where they're having it you just have to be a member of that posse or an in, invitee of that posse so the um, the posses all have their names our, our uh, posse name is the big ben bushwhackers and each cowboy has a cowboy name when you join sas you choose your name your cowboy name is unique to you no duplicates allowed in cowboy action shooting my cowboy action name, which we all have one, there are alias, is the Oklawaha Kid. Christian Mortician. Pearly Hart. Dead Eye Davis. Big Country. Ranger John Paxton. Wabash Valley Slim. Deer Slayer Jim, because whenever the deer season opens, I disappear. My alias is Jesse James. There's 105,000 members in SAS, and there's only one Jesse James in the entire world. Man, I love it. My daughters, I have three daughters. Two of them shoot with me. One of them's here today, Pearly Hart. Uh, she went to the World Championships uh, just this past summer and came in second by just a small margin, her rifle jam, or she would have been the world champion. And that has just given her the fever. So once I got to World Championship, I had people my age and I felt how fun it was. So that made me want to go more. Well, I've been shooting cowboy action shooting for about 25 years. But I've been shooting competition since about 1964. I was in law enforcement. I shot on a pistol team on the department that I was on. I was in the Army Reserve, and I shot on the Army Reserve team, both pistol team and then the rifle team. So I've got a long history of competitive shooting. And one of the guys that I worked with shot cowboy, and he said, well, why don't you do this? So I went to a match and I watched him shoot and I said, I can do that. And I've been shooting ever since. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Once you start it, you'll get hooked. And it, you know, the, all the people that I've dealt with are great people, very friendly, a lot of fun. I got into it because of my brother, the Oklahoma kid. He was doing it before I was and I just decided it looked like a lot of fun. I wanted to try it okay. and it gave me an opportunity that's to spend bad, some time not with my brother that's, that's about what that we weren't just for, talking uh, about work or our parents or what have you we could just seven, enjoy right? doing yeah. something fun yeah, yeah. cowboys are about the most fun posse you're ever going to find you'll you'll come because of the shooting but you stay because of the lifelong friendships you develop cowboy action shooting in southern leon county for wfsu public media i'm mike Plummer. The official start to spring may not be until March 21st, but here in North Florida and South Georgia, we often see signs as early as February in the form of monarch butterflies. WFSU's Rob Diaz de Viegas 
headed out to the St. Mark's Wildlife Refuge to learn more about a special initiative involving these butterflies. This is aquatic milkweed in my garden during the springtime. I raise it to bring monarchs into my yard, but it's in its native swamps in the winter that we find this plant's true ecological importance. So yes, it's dormant, it's cold, but so this is aquatic milkweed, that's aquatic milkweed. It has an egg on it. Really? It has an egg, get over here. This is the only native milkweed species with leaves right now. So this time of the year, you're gonna find monarchs clustered, usually around wetlands, where you find aquatic milkweed. It's early February at the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge, and we weren't expecting to see monarch eggs. But in every year, our seasons are different. And no matter what the season, the Monarch Milkweed Initiative at the refuge wants to make sure monarch butterflies have the milkweed their caterpillars need. The monarch butterfly was petitioned to be listed as a federally protected species a few years ago. And the primary reason for the decline of the monarch butterfly is a very precipitous decline in milkweeds across continental North America, which is the primary plant that monarch butterflies lay their eggs on. If you have no milkweeds, you have no monarch butterflies. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here at St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge launched an initiative to try to stop that decline, at least in our region. Part of that is finding the plants and their seeds. This is what I, I do in order to bring these plants back from the wild, to, to bring them to civilization, to bring them to cultivation. So, um, which I suppose it's not too bad because I can Periodically, I can go ahead and find myself a snack made out of sawgrass. So a very ambitious project that involves growing them in a nursery as well as managing them out in the field. And so we've grown about half a million milkweeds at this point. You like the monarch caterpillar chrysalis and a question mark and then a monarch on the back? Great. Today, volunteers are working on planting one specific milkweed species. Mm -hmm. That is a sprout of Asclepius humistrata. Mm -hmm. Asclepius humistrata, generally known as the sandhill milkweed, pine woods milkweed. It's probably the most important milkweed in the southeastern United States for monarch butterflies because it emerges around that time of the year in May when the monarchs are beginning to return to this region. The monarchs move through here, they utilize Asclepius humistrata, and then they continue north, repopulating eastern North America, and then we see them later, whenever they return in the fall. Scott has been figuring out the best way to grow different milkweeds. He's experimenting with different soil mixtures for Sandhills milkweed. This is four dirt, one perlite, one sand, and one peat moss. Gotcha. Asclepius humistrata has a very long taproot that grows pretty quickly. So to put it in a smaller plastic pot, it just runs into, eh, it can't go any further. So when we do them in here, then this can be planted directly into the ground. You just plant the seed as deep as it is long, so there's just like a little bit of soil covering okay. it, not a lot. So we're just gonna kind of put them in there and then push it down like a little bit. We have a, a machine that grinds up pine needles, uh -huh. and we'll be putting a layer of pine needles on top of it. Oh, okay. And the pine needles deliver a little bit of nutrients to the soil, also protect the seed, they keep it, keep the seed moist. Asclepius humistrata is one of many milkweed species that grow in fire-dependent upland pine forests. Another is a plant more commonly grown at home. For the garden, we do have a number of native milkweed species that are very suitable. One is a butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. One is pink swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata. And another is aquatic milkweed, Asclepius perennis, which are very easy to grow in a wide variety of landscapes and soils. Native milkweed is relatively easy to grow. And when you do, you invite monarchs into your yard. I think everybody should have some kind of milkweed in their yard. You just have to decide which kind. For WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas. You can also create butterfly gardens in your own backyard. WFSU's Rob Diaz de Villegas shows us butterfly caterpillars that you can easily raise here in North Florida.
your own butterfly garden is just the beginning of what we mean when we say the phrase eco-citizen. In addition to taking part in an eco-adventure, it also means turning your discoveries into information that can be used by scientists around the world. WFSU's Rob Diaz de Viegas shows us how you can be an eco-citizen all year long. All you need is the outdoors and a free app on your smartphone. Not many people know about the Elkirk Edwards WEA in Tallahassee. It's a great place to see a lot of plants and animals, which makes it a great place to try out iNaturalist. FWC has a really cool program called Florida Nature Trackers, and as part of it, we're encouraging people to use an app called iNaturalist. Basically what it does is it allows you to record observations you make while out in the field and then share them with others, whether that's other citizen scientists like you or researchers. So if you download the app off the App Store or Google Store or wherever, you have a little icon on your phone. If you want to make an observation, you simply go out in nature, bring your phone with you. All right, the art of catching cricket frogs. Right here. Got him. Click a button within the app that takes a photo. I click next. The app will actually give you suggestions of what you see. It will automatically record your date and time and your location, and then all you have to do is click share. It's literally that easy. Oh, look at this. We got all kinds of stuff. Once you idea species, the iNaturalist community weighs in. Within each project, we have what's called curators, and these are experts in the field. Curators search for observations by species or by genus, so if you just put unknown, it's impossible to find unless they just happen to be on iNaturalist and see that unknown observation, they're never going to find it. So it's always good to at least put plant or flower or something like that to at least put it in some sort of category. If two or more people agree on an observation, it becomes research grade, which is great. That means that's probably what it is. Depending on what you see, your observations can be added to any number of research projects. So whatever your interest, you can join a project, add observations to it, and contribute to the understanding we have of our species here in the state of Florida. There are many different types of citizen science programs available. The iNaturalist app that you saw in that story is the one we're using for our Eco Citizen Day coming up on Saturday, April 27th. From 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., we want you to join us for a free multi location eco adventure. We're teaming up with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and the Coastal Plains Institute to make it all happen. The whole thing kicks off at the Market Space, which is on FAMU Way next to Railroad Square and the Playground. We have special activities for all ages, plus book readings by local nature authors, live music, and PBS Kids Nature Cat will be there. We'll show you how to use the iNaturalist app and encourage you to make observations of your own. You can walk to nearby Lake Alberta for more nature activities or take one of our shuttles to San Luis Park or the Apalachicola National Forest. There'll be so much to see and do, and we're adding new activities all the time. Go to WFSU.org slash Ecology Blog to learn how you can take part in Eco Citizen Day on Saturday, April 27th. One of the places we'll be holding Eco Citizen activities is here at Lake Alberta. It's just a short walk from FAMU Way and the Market Space. Another place we'll be going is the wetlands of the Apalachicola National Forest. WFSU's Rob Diaz de Viegas recently went there on a winter adventure with the Coastal Plains Institute to learn more about this amazing ecosystem. Today was another fantastic release of striped newts back into the Apalachicola National Forest as part of the striped newt repatriation project. In the Munson Sandhills region of the forest, two striped newt releases show us how ephemeral wetlands can change over the span of a few months. 
The striped newts are one of our winter breeding amphibians. They migrate down to the wetlands during cold rainy nights and even though the air temperatures can get down to below freezing, they are active, they are reproducing. They release newts in pairs to increase their chances of mating. Here's the female. She's gravid, full of eggs through the skin there and you can see the eggs. The male, see how large his back legs are? And also he's got little fingernails at the tips of his phalanges. This is the moment I love the most, y'all. Stripe Nuke Project, we get to release them. We haven't had this much rain out here in, in four or five years, and that's a really good thing for the amphibian productions in general and our Stripe Nuke Project in particular. For the majority of this project, this area has been completely dry in between these two wetlands. This is our underwater drift fence, except it's a terrestrial drift fence now underwater because of all of the surplus of rainfall that we've had since the summertime here in the Tallahassee area. Last year, we did not get significant winter rains, so we were not able to release striped newts, adults in the wintertime. Come the summertime, we had just enough rain and just enough water in the wetlands that we felt comfortable releasing larvae. There is something in his belly. Yeah, maybe you can pop it out. If it's in the, in the stomach, you can do it. By netting the wetland and checking drift fences, they know what animals share the wetlands with striped newts. Oh, look at her gulp there. See that? Yeah. That was pretty neat. Their release ponds are lined, so they held water when nearby wetlands were dry. It's natural for them to go dry seasonally, which allows fire to pass through. We want all of our striped newt study wetlands to burn through like this. It's good for the vegetation there. In fact, can you see the, the pine tree crop that was trying to encroach in? One of the reasons for the decline of many of our southeastern amphibians, we believe, is the lack of fire over the past century. When we don't have a lot of rain and the wetland basin is dry and we don't get a lot of fire coming through the wetland basin, a lot of woody vegetation can colonize the wetlands. WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas. There he goes. WFSU is able to do this project thanks to a grant from the program Nature and a three-night event they've got coming up called American Spring Live. Here's more. Nature presents American Spring Live, a real-time adventure into the season that kicks off an exciting new year in the natural world. We'll join scientists as they make discoveries about how longer days and warming temperatures trigger big changes in animals and plants. From Yosemite to the Everglades, spring is coming to you live on PBS. Nature's American Spring Live program, plus the topics of citizen science, our local ecology, and WFSU's Eco-Citizen Day will be the focus of an upcoming Perspectives radio program on WFSU-FM 88.9. On Thursday, March 28th at 11 a.m. Eastern, WFSU's Tom Flanagan will talk with Nature Executive Producer Fred Kaufman and American Spring Live producer Ann johnson Prum about the three-night program. Plus, Peter Kleinhens with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission joins us to talk about our local ecology and the upcoming Tallahassee Leon County City Nature Challenge. WFSU ecology producer Rob Diaz de Villegas, whose stories are often seen on local routes, will talk more about his recent eco adventures tied into Citizen Science and Eco Citizen Day. The program will also be live on Facebook, so follow WFSU Media now so you won't miss it then. As we start to enjoy and celebrate spring, it's hard to believe that summer is right around the corner. Pretty soon school will be out and kids will be in summer camp. So now is the time to figure out what camp is right for your kid. For young women who are interested in the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math, you might want to consider WFSU and the Mag Lab's SciGirls program. Here's more. WFSU Public Media and the Mag Lab SciGirls summer camps are almost here. 
These camps inspire middle school girls to consider careers in science, and they have a blast doing it. Campers don't just sit in a classroom, they go into the field for fun, interactive adventures. There are three types of camps this year. The Sci Girls Camp Discover is a one-week hands-on exploration of the different fields of science. The Sci Girls Camp Quest is a two-week camp where girls can dive deeper into STEM fields and interact with scientists from around the world. And then there's also a Sci Girls Coding Camp. It's a one-week camp that emphasizes the computer sciences. What kind of Sci Girl do you want to be this summer? You have until April 8th to apply, so go to WFSU.org slash Sci Girls to learn more. That's it for this episode of Local Roots. I'm Suzanne Smith on FAMU Way, right next to Railroad Square. Check out other local stories on our website, WFSU.org slash Local Roots. And while you're online, go ahead and like our Facebook page. We'll be updating you on our Eco-Citizen and American Spring Live activities there. For everyone at WFSU Public Media, thanks for watching. Have a great week, everyone. Magnolia trees greet the southern breeze in the land where rivers wind. Seeds that spring up from the past leave us treasures yet to find. Where our children play along the land our fathers build with honest hands. Take a moment now and look around the paradise we have found. Take the low